chapter five, the nature of light. So what is light? So when I say the word light, what do you think of? Does light come in different forms? How fast does it travel? How does it travel? This image is of the ring nebula. It's a very beautiful colored image. But what's important to learn here is that it's actually a false colored image, that astronomers have assigned colors to different wavelengths in terms of what this image is made out of. So oxygen is typically given a blue color. Red is typically different like um, for hydrogen. So it's showing you the structure of this gas cloud based on what it's made out of. So light we are used to in terms of visual light. You're probably thinking like you're seeing light from this screen that you're watching, right? Well, light is more than just what we visually see. It's the full electromagnetic spectrum. So light to start off. So light has two properties. Light can travel both as a wave and a particle, which we call photons. Now all light travels at the same speed in a vacuum, okay, the speed of light. So typically I think of this as 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, or if you wanted to think about miles per second, it'd be 186,000 miles per second. So this is in a vacuum. Once light goes through an atmosphere or say through glass or other materials, it does slow down a little bit. But in, in astronomy, we're talking about light traveling through space. And even when it does slow down through an atmosphere, it's not by much. So properties of a wave that we're going to be useful for astronomy are things like wavelength and frequency. So wavelength is the distance between a crest to a crest of a wave or trough to a trough. And a wavelength is a measure of length or distance. So we think of this in terms of meters or kilometers. So the distance between a light wave crest to crest or a sound wave compression and refraction is the size in a sense of the wavelength. So a long wavelength would have a large distance between crest to crest. A short wavelength would have a small distance from crest to crest. And we represent wavelength using the symbol lambda. So in astronomy, again, we like to have our own units, right? We had the astronomical unit, the parsec, the light year. For a wavelength, we're going to be talking about small distances, okay? So small distances, we tend to want to bring expand out that um, scientific notation and put it in a nomenclature that's easier to talk about. So we're going to be talking about wavelengths in the orders of 10 to the negative 9 meters. So we can represent this as a nanometer, or lowercase nm. Now astronomers also use one other additional unit called the angstrom. Now notice in my slide here it's like a little circle with the accent up here. There shouldn't be an accent. I couldn't figure out how to make just the circle. So it's just the circle for angstrom. So one angstrom is equivalent to 0.1 nanometers or 10 to the negative 10 meters. So when we're talking about wavelengths um, of light and we start talking about star properties, you're going to see either angstroms or nanometers. And now you know what that means. Okay, so when we look at light, we tend to think of just white light, but we can break up light into its primary components using either a prism or a diffraction grating or a spectrometer. So if we take white light, let's say from an incandescent light bulb or light from the sun, it can be broken apart, meaning it's going to be bent into its component colors. In this case, the full spectrum of the rainbow. So red light will have longer wavelength and purple light lower wavelength. So notice that the red light from this white light, once you break, up, break apart the colors, red light exists at 700 nanometers, so that's a longer wavelength than purple light. So I'll often talk about the blue end or purple end of the spectrum, and that's what I mean, being shorter wavelength and the longer end or the redder end of the spectrum being longer wavelength. So when we talk about wavelength, we also want to talk about frequency. So frequency is equivalent to approximately the speed of light over the wavelength. So it's an inverse relation with wavelength. So frequency is measurement of oscillations per time. So it's the number of waves that pass a given point in one second. And we measure this in units of per second. That's a little weird to say. So we've given that the name Hertz or HC. So when we talk about frequency that we're used to, we're used to think about frequency in terms of pitch. Like a higher pitch is going to be higher frequency and a lower pitch being lower frequency. So take a look at these waves over here. Notice the longer wavelength one 
if I put my cursor right here and I said how many waves are going to pass this cursor in one second right it might only be two waves okay that's a low frequency big wavelength let's go to the top one here if I put my cursor right here how many wavelengths how many crests would pass this cursor in one second a lot of crests Okay, this is a high frequency, so the wavelengths are compressed. High frequency, low frequency. A high frequency corresponds to a small wavelength, and a low frequency to a long wavelength. So here we have the wave properties all put together. We have the wavelength, the frequency, the time, how many waves pass that per in certain parts. And waves are moving in this direction, for example. They have a velocity, that velocity being the speed of light. So all of light is energy, and it's made up of electric and magnetic waves because an electric field produces, as a, produces a magnetic field, and they move at the speed of light. So they're perpendicular to each other, and this literally is what light is. So all electromagnetic radiation is light and they travel at the speed of light so we think of just visual light but this full electromagnetic spectrum is what astronomers view as light so here's our visual range it's only a small portion of the full electromagnetic spectrum some guys called the em spectrum for short but it's just a very small part of the full em spectrum all of light so notice we have very long wavelengths to very short wavelengths are high frequency and low frequency. So the full EM spectrum goes from the radio wavelengths all the way to the gamma rays. Now, of course, there are longer and shorter wavelengths, but these are the ones that are most common in astronomy and that we are able to detect. So let's look at each of these individually. Now, all of these travel at the same speed because they are all light. They all travel at the speed of light. So radio waves travel at the speed of light. Gamma rays travel at the speed of light. Visual light travels at the speed of light. So in terms of energy, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. And the lower the frequency, the lower the energy. Now, I tend to call this the higher frequency, the blue end, but it has nothing to do with color. Okay, color is only in the visible wavelengths and the lower frequency being the red end, but again, it's only visible wavelengths that are actually colored. That's just to help you remember which end is which. So a higher frequency corresponds to higher energy. It's just like we learned about in previous lectures, where if you had gas particles and you are exciting them by higher temperatures, you give them a higher temperature, they start moving around more and more, they have more energy. It's the same idea. And a lower temperature will have lower energy. That's very similar with frequency. Higher frequency, more energy. Okay, so let's start with the long wavelengths elect on our radio waves and our microwaves. So these are in the ranges of kilohertz to hundreds of megahertz. And these are our longest wavelengths. So heating up your food in a microwave are using microwaves. Okay, these are wavelengths between one millimeter and one meter, and they jiggle the water molecules in your food, and that's how it heats up your food through the thermal energy of those water molecules jiggling. We also see the microwave radiation coming all around us in our universe, which is showing us the very birth of our universe after the Big Bang, radiating in the microwave wavelengths. Now, astronomers use radio waves to detect energy sources like quasars and other active galaxy sources that are emitting at the radio wavelengths. Infrared radiation um, is just beyond the visible end of the spectrum towards the red end, and this is our heat. Okay, so most substances absorb heat, or some can radiate heat. We radiate heat as humans, and that's why in an infrared camera you can see us, because we're radiating in the infrared. Notice in this image of the Orion Nebula, if we look at the visual light, we see the stars. But if we look in the infrared, we see all these hot gas clouds. Now this isn't too surprising, since look down here at this very hot region near Orion sword, that's where the Orion Nebula is. That's where we have star forming regions. So we know that those are hot areas of dense clouds and dust, and those glow in the infrared. Now visible light, okay, this is the light that we can see from 700 nanometers on the red end to 400 nanometers on the blue end. So we are able to see visual light because of photons are emitted as electrons jump energy levels within different elements. And we'll talk about that a bit later. Ultraviolet radiation coming from our sun, for example, is in the range of 400 to 100 nanometers. 
So we can't see ultraviolet rays, but we can definitely feel them via sunburns. Now, luckily, only one of the ultraviolet, only a few of the ultraviolet rays come through our atmosphere. Most are deflected, thank goodness. And the longest ones can penetrate the ozone layer. Now, you detect this through your skin burning because ultraviolet radiation is higher frequency and therefore higher energy. Now, as we go higher energy, we hit the x-rays. These are in the range of 100 nanometers to 0.1 nanometers. These are so high with such high energy that they can pass through visually opaque matter like your skin, but can reflect off your bones. So x-rays are used to looking at our bone structure. Now, x-rays have also been found to be illuminated off of comets, which is this image in the upper right, which is fascinating because that's the solar wind interacting with comets and ionizing that ice and gas and dust from a comet to such high frequencies that it's emitting in the x-ray wavelengths. Now, the highest energy is our gamma rays. Okay, gamma rays are very short wavelength, very high frequency. Now, luckily, most of gamma rays are blocked by the Earth's atmosphere because gamma rays are in pr produced in areas like the core of a sun where nuclear fusion is happening. Um, also, nuclear fission can create gamma rays. Also, we have random gamma rays produced from radioactive decay of naturally occurring isotopes here on Earth. Gamma rays are particularly used in the medical field for curing some types of cancer and tumors by targeting a tumor with very precise gammas, gamma rays, um, which we call a gamma knife, and they destroy cancer cells. Now, of course, gamma rays can also destroy regular cells, which can cause cancer, but we have been using some gamma rays to actually kill off um, tumor cells. Now, we see gamma rays in in astronomy, um, one neat effect is called a gamma ray burst. These are 100 times brighter than supernova, which are the death of large mass stars, but they're only around for a few seconds to minutes. And they, we think that gamma ray bursts originate from the collisions of a neutron star, which is the death of a star, or the collapse of a very massive star to form a black hole, but we're still not sure. So astronomers are investigating gamma rays to this day. And this image in the upper right is an image of a gamma ray. So telescopes work together to image gamma rays because we never know when they're going to happen and they don't stick around for very long. So telescopes essentially help each other out by notifying if we see a gamma ray that most telescopes try to go look at it if we can. Okay, so here's our full EM spectrum all together, the full wavelengths of light. Visible light being a very small portion going from our high energy gamma rays to our low energy radio waves. So astronomers like to look at all wavelengths of light because if we just looked at visible light, we wouldn't see the whole picture. So instead, astronomers want to look at all various wavelengths of light to show us what's really happening out there. Low energy x-rays or high energy x-rays can tell us that there's high energy particles or things happening. Okay, this is like the death of a star, an exploded supernova. We know some high energy stuff was happening in the center there. Okay, so astronomers like to use the full picture. Here's the full wavelengths of our Milky Way galaxy. When we look at things like the infrared, we notice that our galaxy is made up of a lot of warm dust. Okay, we see that there's gamma ray sources towards the center of our galaxy. We wouldn't know this without looking at the various wavelengths of light, looking at the full electromagnetic spectrum. So take a moment to think about this concept question. You can pause the video and answer it and then go on to see the answer. Again, pause the video to answer this concept question and then check your answer after you've answered it yourself. And then one more, pause the video to answer this question. And then now speed up the video to see the answer. All right, I hope those concept questions helped you a little bit in terms of your studies for this, and we'll pick this up um, the next video.